great. Then uh, let me start by thanking you all for joining today's uh, uh, seminar. We'll get started just in a, a, a little bit, but before we really, really start, just let me remind you that uh, this is the QTech 360 seminars. So what happens here is that we have seminars from all over QTech. That's why it's 360, right? And then that's also a good place to remind you that uh, we also have one next month in December uh, 7th by uh, Guido van der Stolp. Uh, so please uh, put that in your calendar and uh, uh, enjoy that also uh, next month. Uh, but back to today. Uh, today we have a presentation by uh, Marta Pita Vidal. Uh, so Marta did her, uh, she, has, she has two bachelors uh, that she did before she joined uh, QTech for her master degree. Uh, before joining here, she did uh, uh, research in 2D materials at uh, ICFO and MIT. Uh, and now uh, for her master's and for her PhD so far, she has been studying uh, embedding semiconductor nanowires into superconducting circuits. And that's also the topic of today, which is direction of a superconducting spin qubit strongly coupled to a transmit qubit. And this work is really a combination culmination of, of Several works in the in the same group. So so with that, uh, let's welcome Marta. Take it away. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction, Christian, and thank you, Grazie, also for organizing this 360 seminar today. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I am going to present. <laughs> Let me see if this. Yeah, so today we are going to be discussing some results regarding this device shown here in the image, which is a quantum dot surrounded by two superconducting leads. And throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please just interrupt and ask. Um, I'd like to start by introducing the team that uh, worked together to uh, in the project that I'm going to present today especially uh, PhD candidates Tarno Barcherbos, uh, and also PhD candidates Lukas Plithoff and Jab Bersdorf, together with our former postdoc, Lukas Grunhaupt, when he was still around. We worked under the supervision of Leo Kangenhoven and Christian Andersen, and also Angela Ku and Bernard van Heck when they were still here. And all of the theory results I'm going to hint at uh, today are the result of a fruitful, fruitful theory collaboration, which we had with Rod Sitko from Slovenia and Ramon Aguado from Spain. And finally, our materials which we use, we are, which are VLS in the Mars 9 nanowires proximitized by aluminum, were grown by Yuliu from Peter Krogstrup's group in Copenhagen. So with this, let me uh, move on and start by showing you again the image of the device that I showed already at the beginning, but now a bit more of a realistic one. So we have a quantum dot surrounded by two superconducting leads forming a Josephson junction. And this is implemented in an indium arsenide uh, one dimensional nanowire proximitized by aluminum in the parts that we want to be superconducting. And the reason why we are interested in investigating these devices is because it's a very nice platform where many different energy scales come together. Uh, we have a competition between induced superconductivity from the leads, which favors doublet pairing. But at the same time, we have charging energy from the quantum dot, which actually wants to do the opposite split electrons. Um, and this is together with the spin orbit energy from the indium arsenide. And if we apply a magnetic field, same on effects. So all of these energy scales compete with each other. And uh, this is a nice device where we can investigate the interplay of all of this. And furthermore, regarding applications, this is a nice platform for implementing an undressed spin qubit, uh, which is um, yeah, something we are going to discuss now in a bit more detail. It's a type of uh, spin qubit. Uh, which happens in a uh, quantum dot just in junction. Uh, now, this is uh, what I was saying earlier. This is uh, work done by uh, the hybrid security team in Curie. Uh, this is the hybrid part. The security part comes actually from the fact that we integrate these nanowires into superconducting circuits around it. And this, um, the reason why we do this is that we can use high frequency techniques to investigate these devices with higher energy and time resolution than what we can do with other techniques. 
And in particular, regarding the applications of the Andreas spin qubits, uh, this uh, integrating this device into a superconducting circuit allows us to use circuit quantum electrodynamics techniques, which were developed in the superconducting qubit community, to read out this, this, the state of this qubit. So before diving into the technical details, let me start by explaining what's actually an Andreas spin qubit. Also, we'll discuss it more at the end. It's nice to have it in mind when thinking about what properties we want our, our device to have. And I like to describe what it is by comparing it to two other types of qubits you may be a bit more familiar with, the first of which are spin qubits. Spin qubits encode the state of a qubit in the spin of a state localizing one or multiple quantum dots. Uh, and they are quite, they have many advantages uh, or many good characteristics, like the fact that they are small, so we can fit many of them in one chip. They're also compatible with standard uh, nanofabrication techniques for, in for industry. And they also have a large level separation, which allows us to manipulate them uh, relatively fast. Uh, however, uh, it's precisely because of their small size that coupling them to each other, especially if one wants to do it over long distances, is not a trivial task. Although a lot of progress has been made in the past years in this area, and this has recently been achieved by coupling uh, to spin, qub well, spin qubits to a high impedance uh, resonator. And actually, if you want to learn more about that, if you haven't watched the Qtech 360 seminar by Patrick, which happened, I think, last year, I believe it's available online, so I recommend you to watch it. Uh, then, okay, the second type of qubits I want to mention are superconducting qubits, like, for example, the transmission shown in the image. Uh, these type of qubits are radically different from spin qubits in, uh, in the fact that uh, the qubit states are actually now macroscopic circuit, ma macroscopic or oscillations of circuit variables like charge and current. And this is something that can be exploited to couple these qubit states to uh, degrees of freedom in a superconducting uh, circuit around it. And this can be used to couple superconducting qubits to each other, but also to read them out. Uh, however, superconducting qubits are not all advantages either. Currently, their performance is limited by uh, leakage resulting from their small anharmonicity, uh, for the case of transmons, if you try to manipulate them very quickly, and also uh, by cross-coupling of multiple of different devices in the same chip. So something that would be nice would be combining the main characteristics of these two types of qubits together in one same device. And this can be done by uh, bringing this characteristic of superconducting qubits, which is that their qubit state is intrinsically coupled to uh, circuit variables like charge and current, this characteristic we would like to bring to the world of spin qubits. And that's the idea behind a superconducting spin qubit or Andreas spin qubit. We use both terms to refer to the same thing. Uh, in this case, we have a quantum dot similarly to other types of spin qubits, which can be, which is occupied by a single spin. Uh, and the main difference with other types of spin qubits is that now we have two superconducting leads on the two sides. And if we have spin orbit coupling in this system and a phase, a superconducting phase offset between the two leads, we can be in a situation in which the two spin states split in energy. Here I'm showing the energy phase relationship of this junction for each of the two spins. And as a result of this, if we take the derivative versus phase of this energy phase relationship, we get that uh, for each of the two possible spins of the junction, the supercurrent across it is different. Uh, and this is exactly what we were talking about earlier. We have a microscopic qubit state, which is the spin, which is intrinsically coupled to a macroscopic circuit variable, which is the supercurrent. And this can be exploited similarly to how it's done for other types of superconducting qubits to read out these using standard security techniques and also to couple these qubits to each other using superconducting circuits. Uh, so, Oh, one last thing. This I want to acknowledge previous work in this area. Uh, these the first theory proposals um, regarding this Andreas spin qubits are actually from Nasserov's group here in the TU Delft. And there was a first successful implementation of these devices last year in Yale, which is slightly different from what we are going to be discussing today, in that instead of having superconductor, quantum dot superconductor, in their case, they had a superconductor, semiconductor, superconductor, SNS Josephson junction. And the main difference of that device with respect to this is that in their case, the ground state of the system is actually a singlet, which is not one of the two computational uh, states of the qubit. And the, and the qubit 
states were an excited manifold of the qubit. So in that situation, you basically constantly decay to the singlet ground state. That's something you want to avoid. Although in this work, they proved all of the basic characteristics of this uh, Andref spin qubit. So uh, if you want to learn more about these qubits, I refer you to this, to this publication. So with all of this in mind, now that we know what's an, an Andref spin qubit, uh, I'd like to outline the next, well, the rest of this presentation. We're going to divide it in three parts. Uh, the first of which is going to be uh, learning about the basics of this quantum dot junction and learning about under what situations the ground state is a singlet and under what conditions it's a doublet. Uh, our goal for the Andreas Spin Qubit applications is actually to have the doublet to be the ground state. So the situation in which this is occupied by an odd number of electrons. We'll also look at the time dynamics and investigate the lifetime of each of these so that we make sure that uh, we can be in a doublet ground state, but also for a long enough time to be able to use this as a qubit. And once we've done that, we'll go to the next part and we'll look into, okay, how, how, how can we actually distinguish the spin up and spin down states of these, uh, these two doublet states of the junction. Uh, we will actually also look at how we can induce transitions between these two. And finally, in the last part, we will actually treat this as a qubit, investigate uh, coherence properties and learn a bit about uh, what are the origins of the phasing and how to couple it to other types of qubits. Uh, I've already anticipated that uh, we're not going to be looking at a very good qubit instead of co in, in terms of coherence here. As you may remember from the small pitch I gave in a verbose breaking a while back, uh, our T2 times are not excellent. So I want to look at, I, I want you to look at this as a proof of concept that we can actually implement this device. Uh, and while looking, while looking at it, thinking about how to exploit all of the uh, achievements of the spin qubit community, which happened over the last years to actually improve this. Because for example, maybe changing materials, something that one can do to already improve uh, the coherence times and so. But anyway, uh, let's start by, the first step, which is distinguishing uh, the singlet and the doublet ground states and seeing how uh, we can transition from one to the other by changing the control parameters of this device. And to do so, I'd like to show you a basic model of this device next to our actual implementation so that we can compare. Um, the basic model of the device has two superconducting leads with a phase offset of phi across them. And this superconductivity experimentally is induced by uh, proximitizing our nanowire with aluminum. And the phase offset can be controlled by making our device be a part of a, of a superconducting loop. Then at the center, we have a semiconducting quantum dot with a certain charging energy U and a level and an energy level Xi. Experimentally, this quantum dot is the central part of the nanowire that is not proximitized by aluminum. And the energy level can be controlled with the central gate, which we call the plunger, uh, which is directly underneath it. And finally, we have to tunnel barrier separating the leads from the quantum dot with two tunnel rates, gamma L and gamma R. And these two tunnel rates can be controlled with the two tunnel gates that we have at both sides of the quantum dot junction. Now, if we think of the isolated quantum dot part itself, it can be occupied by either an even or an odd number of electrons. So it can be in a singlet or a doublet state. Uh, and if we bring it together with superconducting leads, we can we have a competition between the induced superconductivity from the leads, which favors singlet pairing, and the charging energy of the dot, which under certain conditions favors doublet pairing. So depending on the relative values of all of these energy scales that define the system, we can be in a situation in which either the singlet or the doublet is the ground state of the system. And with uh, numerical calculations from our theory uh, collaborator, we can actually distinguish, uh, well, we can actually calculate the energies of the singlet and doublet states, and check which of the two is the ground state for each combination of uh, model parameters. Here I'm showing a characteristic dome shape as a function of the dot energy level and the coupling to the leads gamma. If we're inside the dome, the doublet is the ground state. If we are outside, the singlet is the ground state. Now, the main goal of this first part of the talk is being able to distinguish between these two using our readout circuit, which we have around the device. Uh, and to do so, we are going to look at a qualitatively different characteristic of this uh, doublet and singlet states. 
if our quantum dot junction is in a singlet state, uh, it has an energy phase relationship, which is two pi periodic and looks like a cosine, which is uh, what one would expect for any Josephson junction. Um, so that's normal. Then, uh, however, if we have a doublet ground state of the quantum dot junction, we again have a two pi periodic Josephson potential and energy, energy phase relationship, but now it's, it's shifted by pi with respect to what we have in the singlet. And that's why also we call this uh, pi junction when it's in a doublet crown state. So uh, we are going to exploit these intrinsically different current to phase relationships of the junction um, to be able to distinguish these two states using our readout circuit, which in this case is a transmon. So let me show you how that looks. Here we see again our quantum dot junction here, and now it's integrated in a superconducting circuit which has an island in red, a transmon island, and ground in purple. The transmon island is connected to ground via a capacitor with charging energy EC, and a squid loop formed by a Joseph's reference Josephson uh, junction with Josephson energy EJ, and then our quantum dot junction of interest. And if we look at the Hamiltonian of this uh, circuit, we see that we have a charging term and a Josephson term, which are just the normal terms that one would have in any standard transmon, so these two are well understood. And then we adapt to that uh, the potential of the quantum dot junction. And this potential is the one that will be different depending on which state we are at. Sure. Yes. The, the uh, symbols here, the terminology, how do they relate to the symbols of the last slide? So here, here you have EJ and then VSD. And uh, on the slides you were using um, psi and gamma. And I guess these are related. Yeah, so these are the the model the yeah the model parameters, and uh, as a result of all of these, we get some uh, energy phase relationship which has a prefactor EJ, which is a function of those parameters. So basically, the potential of the doublet and the singlet. I'm just combining all of those parameters into this prefactor. Uh, you can get exactly which prefactor you have with the numerical calculations that we have. Uh, and so the, the singlet condition at, at zero, uh, well, zero detuning, right? Yeah. Um, so xi is zero. Uh, that basically means that even though from single particle charging effects, you would expect one particle to be there, there are still two particles because the coupling with the superconductor is so strong that, that this favors. Yes, basically it's like yeah. you, they're in the induce superconductivity from the leads wins when you couple them a lot, right? When gamma becomes too lar larger, large compared to the charging energy, the superconductivity that is induced from the leads uh, wins, basically. And uh, yeah. if you were to translate this uh, axis, the x-axis onto induced charge, uh, can you do that? Like, uh, Yeah, I should have put here the expression for psi. Psi is actually the level minus u divided by u or, or no, not just the level uh, zero would be uh, the transition uh, would be inducing say either zero or two charges. So I said yeah, this is being in resonance with the chemical potential of the leads. Basically, your level is at the so aligned. It's actually periodic as a function of with two charges. So yeah, like in real life, you would have. So we only look focusing just one dome, but then if you look at the more general gate map of it, you see multiple domes uh, after each other. Because yeah, your next level comes in, yeah. and the separation would be two uh, electrons, right? Not one. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Although I have to say, we don't see a very regular pattern in these devices. Uh, try to visualize it in terms of Coulomb peaks. So. Yeah. No, but we don't see very like perfectly regular parabolas. Any other questions? Okay. So, okay, like the main summary from here is we only care about this fact that one energy phase relationship is shifted by pi in order to distinguish them. Um, and to see in a bit more pictorial way how to do that with the transmon, uh, the potential seen by the transmon is actually the addition of this uh, singlet or doublet potential plus the reference junction potential, which at zero external flux looks like this um, for the singlet we have constructive interference with the potential of the reference junction. So the curvature around zero becomes more steep. 
Well, for the doublet, we have destructive interference, so the, cur the curvature around zero becomes less steep. Uh, and the transmon energy levels are basically defined by, uh, determined by this curvature. So they are going to be different for the uh, singlet and doublet ground states. And in particular, the transition between them is going to be different. So the transmon frequency, which is the quantity we have access to experimentally, is different depending on whether we are in a singlet or in a doublet ground state in the, in the quantum dot junction. And this is what we look at actually with our devices. So before showing you how that looks, let me show you how our device looks. Uh, we implement uh, this circuit in a two by seven millimeters chip where all of the structures are defined in a thin film of naive titanium nitride. And at the center, we have a coplanar waveguide, a feed line with input and output ports for transmission measurements. And coupled to it, we have a readout resonator, which has a capacitive part in yellow and an inductive part in pink, so it's an LC resonator. And coupled to it, capacitively, we have a transmon island in red, uh, which is in turn connected to ground by a squid loop. So this red part is the transmon island, this purple is ground, and we have in the squid loop the reference junction controlled by just one gate, and our Josephson junction, our quantum dot Josephson junction of interest controlled by the three gates. Now we can monitor the transmission through this feed line as a function of all of the control parameters of the quantum dot junction and observe uh, transitions between singlet and doublet. And to do so, we are going to start focusing on the central gate, which controls the energy level, and see what happens when we vary it. So we look here at the resonator as a function of the plunger gate, and we observe some resonance shape with two abrupt jumps at the middle, and already seeing a jump indicates that something is switching there. Uh, if we do two-tone spectroscopy and look at the frequency of the transmon instead, uh, we again see these two abrupt jumps in transmon frequency. And in particular, with an arrow here, I'm indicating the set point set by the reference junction when your quantum dot junction is completely pinched off. And we see that for the outer two parts, the transmon frequency is above that set point, and for the inner part is below. This is for zero external flux. If we revert the external flux and apply half a flux quantum through the loop, we see that this effect is reverted. Uh, so the central part now is now above. And this brings us back to what I was saying earlier about the constructive or destructive interference for the singlet and doublets. At zero external flux, the singlet will have a higher frequency because of constructive interference of the potentials, and the doublet will have a lower one. So we can identify these uh, outer parts are at singlet ground state parts, and this central region in plunger as a doublet ground state region. Uh, Furthermore, uh, if we want to actually check how these current phase, uh, energy phase relationships look like, we can uh, fix our plunger gates at one value inside the, in, in the inner region or in the outer region. And we see that for the region we think is a singlet, uh, we have a two pi periodic dependence as a function of flux. Uh, and for the region that's a doublet, we have a two pi periodic dependence that's shifted by pi with respect to it. So this is our pi junction or our doublet uh, ground state. Now, uh, all of this was changing the plunger voltage, which controls this dot level. We can also see what happens if we vary the, the coupling to the leads with our tunneling gate. Um, and what we obtain looks like this. So here I'm plotting versus the plunger level as before. This dash line is basically that measurement or, yeah. And the vertical axis here is the tunnel, uh, the tunnel gate that controls the coupling to the lead. So we recover this dome shape that we had uh, expected uh, from our theory. And what I'm plotting here is the transmon frequency subtracting this set point indicated by the arrow. So positive values in red mean singlet and negative values in blue mean doublet because of the destructive interference. Um, so, okay, we have already learned how to tune our device to be in a doublet ground state, which is what we will want for the Andreas Pinkubit applications. Uh, we actually want it to stay there for enough time to be able to use it as a qubit. Uh, and we actually can check that also because we have this device integrated into a superconducting circuit. We are using high frequency techniques. So we can actually look in time at, uh, at jumps in time between one state and the other. And one place where it's very easy to do that is you go here where you see at the transition between both ground states where they are closely in energy and they will be jumping all the time. 
uh, and you look at the transmission through the field line in real time, at the IQ blobs in time, and what we actually observe is that we are transitioning from one state to the other continuously. And we take these measurements for quite a long time. We do some spectral analysis on them and we extract the lifetimes of the singlet and the doublet. And if we do that for all of the plunger voltages, uh, we actually can follow the lifetime of the doublet in purple and of the singlet in orange as a function of the plunger. We see that they become more or less equal close to the transition, which makes sense because they are closely in energy. And when the doublet becomes the ground state in this central region, its lifetime is above one millisecond, which is uh, fine for already trying to do some uh, qubit experiments here. Um, so where, where is this stick in terms of the vertical axis that you showed before? Uh, how much thermal coupling? Uh, this is taken, okay, I, can, I don't know if I indicate, no. Uh, it's taken more or less something a bit below this. I, I then indicate the exact tunnel value here, so I don't remember exactly, but it's somewhere like here. Because presumably, if you go lower, it's going to become base, right? But, but... Uh, well, that's something actually we see in this image, more or less. Uh, we then investigate a lot of set points, so I'm sure maybe it's better, it's possible to get it better, but what we see in general is that inside of the dome, once you, you yeah, brought it clearly to be the ground state, it's normally uh, one to two orders of magnitude larger than the lifetime of the singlet. Uh, we've seen around yeah, two milliseconds or so, but it's probably something you can optimize. We don't spend a lot of time doing it. But it may also be limited by quasi-particle poisoning, right? Because if you poison your dot, then you jump to the singlet, even if it is higher energies. I mean, coming from the quantum dot world, mm. you know, it normally can be days or weeks or, or years. I mean, so, so why is that different here? Uh, I am not sure. So, like an effect that, yeah, indeed, if, uh, as I was saying, if you have quasi particle poisoning from any quasi particle in your superconductor, it can be that it ends there and it just forces it to jump. Why would it uh, the top? It's a charging energy. But it has an, yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it can be that we also can get it higher. We just investigated uh, some set points. But I'm not sure what's intrinsically different because indeed it's very different from one day, of course. I think it's the YSR states. Ah, okay. So that's maybe <laughs> we should revisit at the end because it requires a bit more context. But there's a different type of singlets that is mm -hmm. not having two quasi particles on the dots. It's a quasi particle on the dots that hybridizes with a quasi particle in the deeds and that yeah. doesn't have to pay the charging energy fully, so to speak, it's through an exchange interaction with the leads. So if you break a Kumba pair in your leads, right? That has to, uh, like, the most natural thing, right, is that this body particle then will then form and stay with your quantum dot, right? Because where else would it go? Yeah, instead of paying you, you pay delta basically because you split a Cooper pair on the lead. Yeah. Yeah, so you gain in the leads. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. That's yeah okay, so it may be. And it's more or less delta, and then yeah, you don't go to infinity. Yeah, also in that case, I would expect that if you go to lower and lower gamma, then it should still improve because you are to have a less YSR character and more just, well, yeah, it may be like, but for sure that's something that's intrinsically different here than just normal spin, uh, normal quantum dots. Okay. Um, so now that we learn how to choose a set point where we are in a doublet ground state and stabilize it for some time um, without having without constantly being jumped into the singlet, we can start thinking about the second part. Uh, until now, we haven't mentioned spin at all yet, and I was saying this is a spin qubit. Um, so now let's start thinking about that in order to see the two spins, uh, to distinguish the two spins uh, with our readout circuit. I already told you we are going to need spin orbit coupling. Uh, so let's see how introducing a spin orbit coupling into the picture changes uh, the situation. So this um, here I'm showing you again the basic model of our device that we looked at earlier. Uh, in this case, the quantum dot had just one level in this model and the coupling to the leads was a uh, spin conserving rate. Uh, if we have spin orbit coupling, our spin is going to be mixed as it transitions from lead to dot and a way of modeling that is adding a spin flipping tunnel in turn between the lead and the quantum dot. 
And furthermore, in a real device, we may have higher line levels, so they are not occupied uh, that contribute to the transfer of electrons from one lead to the other. And that can be added to the model as a direct tunnel in term between one lead and the other. It's a way of simplifying it. We have all of these energy scales. We can be, depending on their value, in a situation in which the spin up and spin down states in energy with a certain energy splitting ESO. And the way in which this looks in energy phase relationship is that, okay, before we had that the singlet was a cosine, the doublet was a shifted cosine. But now if we add these extra elements to the model, we see we get an extra sign contribution for the doublet. And it has a different uh, sign depending on whether it's spin up or spin down. So this can be actually exploited in the same way as we did before to distinguish these two states with a transmon. Um, here I'm plotting the energy levels where G and E denote ground and excited transmon states and spin down and spin up are the two spin states. Uh, sorry, and yeah, these arrows represent the transition frequency of the transmon and that's going to be different depending on which of the two states we are at. Uh, and also different for the singlet, of course. So if we go to back to our dome and sit somewhere outside of the dome where the ground state is a singlet, we, of course, as before, see just a, a two byte periodic uh, dependence of the transmon frequency on flux. That's not surprising. It's the same as before. But now if we go inside of the dome, uh, we, can, we find in certain situations that um, apart from being shifted by pi, the transmon frequency splits into different branches. And this is a signature, or this is directly what we were saying here, that we observed it to spin separately. Now I have to say uh, this ESO, so this level of the splitting varies a lot depending on the exact values of the model parameters, so all of these rates, and these rates depend on the exact wave functions of the states involved. So they depend directly on the electrostatic potential on the quantum dot, which means they depend on our exact uh, gate set point. So if we change gate set points, we see, so each of these is for a different gate set point, sometimes inside of the dome, sometimes for a different dome. And we see lots of different behaviors. So sometimes it, uh, the two branches don't split at all. And this is actually the case for the previous section. Uh, this is what we were discussing earlier. Sometimes the ESO, the prefactor of the sign, is comparable to the prefactor of the cosine. And sometimes it really just dominates. So you can find different behaviors. <laughs> Something that you can see here in both in all of the plots I'm showing is that you see both lines at the same time. And this is because with the transmon, we are sensitive to the potentials that are, sorry, the, the potentials of the states that are populated. And here you see that for the highest TSOs that we got uh, around this set point, um, we, well, we had something like 0 0.6 gigahertz uh, separation between the, um, the two levels, and this translated into a thermal energy scale is less than 50 millikelvin. So uh, here at zero magnetic field, both states are thermally populated, basically, and that's why we see both. Uh, yes. But in general, is it true that you want as large an ESO as possible? Uh, depends on for what, <laughs> but for the applications of coupling these to other, uh, coupling an Andreas pin qubit to other things, the supercurrent across it, uh, is directly proportional to ESO. So if you want to couple it, we'll see later, if you want to couple it to a transmon, as we are going to see, the coupling strength is proportional to ESO. And then I'll also show you in the outlook, if you want to couple uh, these qubits like this to each other via supercurrent, you also want higher ESO to increase the coupling, if you want large coupling, of course. But I was asking, I mean, if I just look at those potentials, don't I want those two lines to be as far apart as possible? Like, I don't want the situation at the bottom, right? Uh, if I want to make a qubit out of those. Yeah, that's actually something related to the next slide, if you want to show it to you. So this is a situation we had in all of the plots in the previous slide, basically. Um, if you apply a magnetic field uh, with the same effect, you expect both branches to split in energy, right? And that's something that already helps with what you were saying. They just split in energy, and then uh, you will avoid this problem of the thermal population of the excited state. But actually we are looking at transmon spectroscopy here and transmon, the transmon frequency is not sensitive to any uh, phase constant offsets of the potentials. So the way in which it looks in transmon spectroscopy again, uh, yes, it's like a signature of saying this, right? The way in which it looks is that as they split more and more in energy and the excited state stops being thermally populated, 
this uh, transmon branch corresponding to it starts disappearing basically because you don't see it anymore. But it stays in the same place because this is, yeah, any constant offset doesn't change anything. Uh, but this we can use to just make sure they are split in energy, which is what you were asking, right? Okay. So this is just looking at them. So this we exploit for readout, but something we want to do actually to use this as a qubit is being able to drive this transition. And to do so, what we do, uh, well, just to go back to the energy level we had before, we were looking until now at the trans at the spin conserving transmon transitions. Uh, what we want to actually now look at is the transmon conserving spin transition, which is the qubit transition here. And to excite that, uh, what we do is that we add a drive tone going in through the central gate underneath the quantum dot. Uh, and by sending uh, an excitation RF tone through it, which is an electrical signal, but couples to the spin because of the spin orbit coupling in the nanowire, BIE ESR, the electric dipole spin resonance. We send a pulse through it and we see a zero magnetic field that we excite this uh, transition. And this you see here is, doesn't have a huge signal to noise ratio. That's probably because of this thermal population of both states. If we apply a magnetic field, we split them in energy. We see that this transition frequency goes up in frequency, of course, um, and it becomes a bit more clear. We can actually follow this spin flip transition as a function of the applied magnetic field. And it follows a linear dependence, as one would expect. Uh, and from it, we extract a G factor of 12.7, which is makes sense because it's in between two, the, the G factor of aluminum and something like 15, the G factor of indium arsenide. Um, so with magnetic field, we can actually tune our, what's going to be a qubit transition frequency uh, over a large range. And in particular, uh, yeah, we can reach, we can go from zero to something like 12 gigahertz in this range. So with this, we basically have all of the ingredients that we need to actually use this as a qubit now. Uh, so we can jump to the third part. Um, we choose some set point, which for the results that I'll show here is this orange one at 65 millitesla with a qubit frequency of something like 11.5 or something like that, gigahertz. Um, and we send now instead of a spectroscopy tone, we send a Gaussian pulse through the central gate with a central with a certain amplitude and uh, length. And as a function of uh, its length, we observe some oscillations with a decaying envelope. This is a standard Rabi measurement. We can also change the amplitude of the pulse, and we observe yeah, different frequency of these oscillations as a function of the amplitude of the pulse. And by fitting them, um, we extract Rabi frequencies that grow up to above 200 megahertz, which is useful for fast qubit control. So with this, we calibrate our pi over two and pi pulses to try to investigate the coherence of these devices. Um, if we send a pi pulse in this case of eight nanoseconds and wait for a bit for the qubit to decay, we measure T1. So here I'm plotting the population as a function of this wait time. And at, at this set point, we extract a T1 of 24 microseconds. We see it that it varies quite a bit with magnetic field and so. Uh, but yeah, for this set point is 24. And uh, if we apply two pi over two pulses separated by a wait time, we can investigate the T2 time of the qubit, the T2 Ramsey time. And what we observe is this uh, exponential decay from which we extract a T2 star or T2 Ramsey of 11 nanoseconds. If we include a pi pulse in between the two pi over two pulses, we see that the echo time is 37 nanoseconds. And these two times, uh, if you are familiar with coherence times of qubits are very short. Uh, they are also very similar to what's been observed previously in other similar qubits in indium arsenide and indium antimonide. So it can be that all of these are limited by the fact that we are using indium, which has a super large uh, nuclear spin. Also arsenic has a very large nuclear spin. Uh, but I mean, it can be still limited by charge noise or other uh, other types of noise. We'll look into that a bit more now. Uh, one way of learning a bit about the origin of noise is doing a CP sequence in which instead of adding just one pi pulse in between the, pi, the two pi over two pulses, you add a few equidistant ones and plotting the extracted T2 times as a function of the number of pi pulses, 
we observe some exponential dependence, which if you fit, uh, you extract an exponent of 0 0.5, and this uh, corresponds to, uh, this we can relate to the spectral, uh, to the spectrum of the noise that is making it decoherent. Decoherent from it, we extract that this comes from one over F noise, at least in some frequency range. Um, so this already allows us to learn a bit about the origin of noise here. Uh, something else we can, okay, but one candidate we have is, uh, of course, nuclear spins we were mentioning earlier, but there are a few other candidates. Any, basically any control parameter, anything we have around can affect it, right? Uh, we can have flux noise coming from the fact that we are using flux to, to control this. We are also applying a magnetic field, so there can be some magnetic field noise. What we were mentioning, we have all of these nuclear spins uh, creating a, a background magnetic fluctuation. We have three gates situated directly underneath, which can bring charge noise, and we can even have charge noise from other sources around. The first easy thing that you can think of to see if one of these is the dominating one is seeing how the T2 times vary when you vary each of the control parameters. We vary magnetic field, and we don't see the T2 times to, they don't change much. If we change the flux going through flux switch spots, we also don't see any big improvement. So it doesn't seem to be flux that's limiting us. It also doesn't seem like we are polarizing nuclear spins or something in this range of magnetic fields. We can also look at what happens if we vary the gates, uh, even going through some gate uh, switch spots, our T2 times stay low. Although I have to say this, we then go through a simultaneous, a simultaneous sweet spot for all three gates at the same time. And even if it is not coming through the gates, we can still have charge noise from other sources. Um, so this doesn't help us much. We, we just discard the fact that it's not flux noise. Uh, something else we did uh, to try to learn a bit about the origin of this defacing is uh, we have these Rabi fits for a bunch of different amplitudes. And from it, we can extract the Rabi frequency and the decay Rabi time as function of the amplitude. And if we relate them to each other, we saw that from this publication from Philip Malinowski, which is actually also here in QTech, um, we saw that by relating them, we can fit them with an expression that let us uh, give a get some uh, estim estimate of the fluctuations in frequency of the qubit. And by doing so, we extract that the um, fluctuations of qubit frequency that uh, we have are something of the order of 39 megahertz. So assuming that uh, this noise comes mostly from just one of the possible control parameters that we have, we can use the susceptibility of the qubit frequency to different control parameters to estimate more or less how much noise we have in each, we would have in each if it was limiting it. So for example, for the left lead, when we vary it, the, the left um, gate, when we vary it by one millivolt, the frequency of the qubit is changing by 160 megahertz. Similarly, for the parallel magnetic field, when we vary it by one millitesla, the qubit frequency is changing by 180 megahertz. So translating this, uh, oscillations in qubit frequency into oscillations of these control parameters, if they were the limiting factor, we see that for the gate noise, we would expect 0 0.25 millivolts, uh, the, the root mean square of the gate noise. And that sounds like a lot. It's, uh, we, in, the same in the same fridge for similar devices, we typically can control the gates to a finer step than this. Uh, although we could still have this noise coming from other parts of the chip, probably. But this at least doesn't sound like it's coming from the gate lines. Uh, however, for the magnetic field, we get values of uh, oscillations of magnetic fluctuations uh, of this order, which are actually compar comparable to estimates that have been made before in other publications and in the Marsanite and in the Mantimonite. Uh, so, Okay, probably the main candidate is uh, magnetic fluctuations coming from nuclear spins of indium, although we can never entirely discard the voltage noise, so that can still be contributing. So this is yeah, where uh, what we thought about the origin of the coherence, and I want to spend a couple of minutes now on sh showing you some good news, actually, uh, which is that we can uh, show this, this main characteristic of the Andreev spin qubit, which is that it's spin is intrinsically coupled to a circuit variable, and that can be used to couple this and drive spin qubit to other superconducting qubits. In this case, what we tried is, this is already integrated into a transmon circuit, 
so a way in which we can look at the Andreas spin qubit to transmon coupling is okay, we've been looking until now at the spin conserving transmon transitions and the transmon conserving spin transitions. Uh, but we can also, if, if they are coupled to each other, we could also observe this double excitation transition or the transition that swaps the states of both qubits uh, if both of them are coupled to each other. And this is something that uh, we actually observe experimentally. So this is the double excitation and this is the transition that exchanges the, time, the, the state of both qubits. We haven't tried so here, but something that one could do with this would be trying to drive this selectively um, in a certain order to try to implement a two-qubit gate, for example. Also, probably for that, you would need higher, longer Q2 times. But okay, this is a signature of the fact that they are coupled and a second signature of the fact that they are coupled and maybe a bit more visual one is the fact that when you apply a magnetic field and bring the excited spin in resonance with the transmon, uh, if they are coupled, they hybridize with a certain hybridization energy J. So even a spectroscopy, we would expect to observe an avoided crossing between them. Uh, so we do that. We bring the magnetic field up to a point where the transmon excited state and the up spin uh, of the Andrea spin qubit are in resonance. And with, and with flux, we make them cross each other and we observe uh, an avoided crossing from which we extract a coupling energy of 58 megahertz, which is four times larger than the, the coherence rate of the Andrea spin qubit, which is the one that coheres faster. So this, is, this means that we have strong coupling between the two qubits. Uh, so with this, I'd like to conclude, first briefly summarize the main results that we showed here, which are uh, this being able to distinguish a singlet and the doublet states uh, with a transmute circuit. Then we looked at when we have spin orbit coupling into the picture, how that allows us to distinguish the spin up and spin down states. Finally, we looked at how to treat these two spin up and spin down states as a qubit. And now when thinking about next steps, there are many things that one could do. Uh, investigating the origin of the phasing, maybe playing a bit more with this coupling to the transmon and trying to implement two qubit gates or something else. Something we are actually thinking about now is what would happen if you try to couple the, these two Andreas spin qubits to each other. Um, for that, I have a, one last slide. Uh, so we are thinking about, um, yeah, if you have two Andreas spin qubits in two separate loops, but that share an inductance, you have a super current coupling between the two of them. And in this situation, you expect a Hamiltonian like this in which you have a longitudinal coupling between the two Andreas spin qubits. Uh, this magnitude of the longitudinal coupling strength grows linearly with ESO for each of the two qubits. So if, yeah, basically quadratically, if both of the ESOs are, grow equally. And also you can switch it off with flux through either one of the loops or bring it to its maximum. So it's quite tunable and this would be something that would be fun to play with. So this is something we've started uh, uh, working on, but still far in the future. Uh, so with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and take any other questions you may. Great, thank you, uh, Marta. Uh, let's uh, take some questions. Also online, you're welcome to ask uh, questions in the chat and uh, Gracia will uh, convey them to us. Uh, yes, Kedama. Yeah. More uh, in the long run, right? Right. When, when you, if you try to couple these and rest in qubit, the footprint of the, of the device between the two spin qubits is the order of the, what we have with transpons or it's smaller? Uh, it depends on exactly what circuit you make for what we've been thinking. Uh, you need to be able to tune the flux through these loops. So what limits the, well, the size of the device has to be large enough to be able to thread some flux through the loops, right? So it depends on how much you can couple to them. If you use a flux line, probably cannot be extremely tiny, but still the size of the device will be, will depend on the size of the loop basically. Which can be, yeah. So, so you are in a way losing uh, the, the quality of the speed qubit of being a small footprint. Or, a, a bit, or not that it's a bit in between, but it's not as large as a transmon. So it's the main, dis well, not disadvantage, but something that's a bit problematic for transmons, for example, is that they cross couple, right? If, so their modes are huge, actually. 
and they can couple capacitively to each other, even if they are far away. While here, uh, the qubit mode is just a spin and it only couples to the outside world via supercurrent. So you wouldn't have this cross coupling of devices very far from each other in a chip. So of course it loses a tiny bit with in terms of fitting many devices in a chip with respect to other spin qubits, uh, but it doesn't have these cross coupling issues from being huge. Uh, <laughs> uh, Francesco was first. So, then following up on this question, if I understand correctly, if you want to have 10 Andrew spin qubits, you just need to put 10 loops or nine loops plus one transform, right? The transform in this case is not really needed. We used it for readout because we had it there. Oh. Uh, you could just couple it to a resonator, for example, or like just something that's sensitive to the inductance in this oh. loop, basically. I was thinking that you can use the shared transmon to couple them by each other. Uh, or you don't need the transmon to cross couple. You could also do that, but I mean, you can also directly couple them to each other with supercurrent. So, okay. Okay. Uh, also, I mean, there is also a third way, which is uh, you can read in this uh, publication here, which is couple them by wave function overlap. So, really just putting them next to each other. But here, you don't exploit the supercurrent to spin coupling, right? That would be a bit more similar to just putting a spin qubit next to each other. Yeah. 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 Uh, so now decoherence, have you considered uh, the charge noise coupled to a decoherence via spin of the coupling? Uh, it's more or less what I meant by the stars lying around. Uh, but we have, uh, we, we know it can be an option that there is some other charge noise around and it be via EDSR because of the spin orbit coupling, it couples to the spin, um, we cannot rule it out. So we would have to do further experiments to really make discern that from magnetic fluctuations from the nuclear spins. Yeah. I remember there is a set of figures that you can, by tuning the top parameter, you can change the spin or can couple it. So is that something you can quickly turn it on? Yeah, that, that would be a way of looking into this. Yeah, yeah you can, yeah, you can go, I, have a backup slide for that, but I actually don't know how to do that, but I can describe it to you. Uh, you have in this dome, you can go closer or farther from the edges or up and down in gate, and you can really vary your ESO, your spin orbit splitting. So if you do that and you see that you start being more or less sensitive to noise, it would probably be a signature that charge noise is playing a role in it. So that would be a way of distinguishing it. We haven't looked into this much though. Yeah. Yeah. So about the nuclear spins, so if I understand correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, nuclear spins can uh, cause decoherence in two ways. One is the nuclear spin, the size of it, and the other is the fact that they're uh, just gives you a random fluctuating field. Right? Yeah, that's what I understand. So if you polarize your nuclear spins, presumably you get rid of one of them, that's right? Is this correct? Uh, or why not both? I'm I'm not a, a, an expert in spin qubits. Interaction, right? Which yeah. scares about the nuclear spin itself. Yeah. And the other is the fact that you have perhaps random orientations. Of ah, yeah. So it can be that you polarize them in one direction, so you get rid of that longitudinal noise, for yeah. example, but it still oscillates a bit or so in the yeah, background. So what I was wondering is that do you have an idea for what kind of fields would polarize the nuclear spins in the Indian arsenic? So you have this plot versus B, where you didn't see anything happen. Yeah, really. yeah this one right yeah. here. Yeah. But perhaps something happens or not if you go higher where you polarize the nuclear. I don't know what kind of fields polarize. Uh, yeah, the problem here was that we couldn't go much higher because our qubit frequency was already getting out of what we can measure. It would be something interesting to investigate what happens at higher fields in case yeah, we start seeing that it improves yeah, when. Yeah, we, we, we did discuss it. And I think what, what, what we found it is for people doing just indium arsenide like. But with no, uh, let's say, uh, superconducting stuff, there they they need probably like two or three times more uh, magnetic fields to start seeing anything uh, polarize. Um, so it's. Uh, but I think I mean yeah. before you see any polarization, maybe two or three times more is sufficient. But before it begins to impact your D two, I think you need to go orders of magnitude. Probably yes. Yeah. Even if it's five percent polarized, there's still about the same number of fluctuations. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so that would probably mean a lot of, I mean, we can also tune our G factor with Gate, so we could also bring G factor down and try to apply higher fields, uh, but it's it would be a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, no, then. Or you could go to like one Tesla, right? We, we can apply one Tesla, but with the, but still, you can also just get rid of Indium <laughs> and, and try to, <laughs> to find an alternative. <laughs> yes. Uh, there be a way to make this key report without an external magnetic field at all? Uh, well, you need flux, but apart from that, it works without an external magnetic field. It like we've already we measured the coherence at effectively zero field, excepting for the fact that we are applying a flux. Ah, uh, okay. No, I was thinking that maybe. Another possible advantage compared to at least uh, the spin qubits that we're using is, is that you could do it all electrically. But if you're saying you need flux, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you can use a flux line for that. So you don't need really a global magnetic field, for example. But um, yeah, especially for the, like, if you think more as, as an outlook and trying to couple these to each other, uh, you will need to tune the flux to tune the coupling, like I was showing here. Uh, Unless you don't want to tune it. I mean, I don't know. I uh, we haven't thought about exact details of how this would work. In, but yeah, it, it's, it's useful to have flux at least to investigate it. But on a typical occurrence, do you need to maneuver the flux over this axis? Uh, depends on the size of your loop. For the loops, we have now something like one milli amp. Uh, we haven't optimized much, though. Uh, maybe one can push it, but yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, is the hard gap uh, important? Because uh, you are protected from charging energy, right? But on the other hand, if there's a quasi particle on the lead, uh, yeah, the silver current might have some. It can be that yeah, these lifetimes that we saw that are not incredibly large. Well, it's related to the discussion we were having earlier. It can be that if you don't don't have a hard gap, then you have higher chances of poisoning your leads and therefore poisoning this part of the state that lives in the lead. So it, I would imagine that it can improve with hard gap. Yeah. Or with a, I don't know, but this, or that it would become better with a soft, it would become worse with a softer gap. I don't know. Yes. Sure. But is actually the, the readout time the same as what we uh, Like one to two microseconds, if I'm not wrong, but I would have to check. Arno says yes, so I guess I'm. Do you know what the limit is? Or could it be 10 or 11 times faster? I mean, this is the first experiment. Sometimes it's possible to improve it, sometimes not. We should have varied it more. I, we, I don't think we could vary it that much. So, yeah, I'm not. Super sure. I don't know if Arno, you know, you have an idea of what's been limited by our uh, T two, and that's the pi pulse. During the pi pulse, we already have some decoherence. But that's in terms of just fidelity, right? In, in terms of SNR, right? I think we we could crank it up quite a lot because it's limited essentially by the sort of dispersive shift to the readout resonator, which goes through the transmon, which is sort of something we actually. I don't think that was sort of on purpose optimized in this device. Uh, so mm -hmm. it was mostly optimized in the beginning to just get good transform readout, which is slightly different than getting good spin qubit <laughs> readout. So, so I'm sure like, okay, 100 times faster is probably not possible, but I think it's probably for sure possible to bring it to sort of standard superconducting qubit times, which is maybe two or 300 numbers. So, I mean, you know, if you think about the longer term, perspective and, and what can make this attractive. I would say one of the uh, difficulties still with the conventional speed qubits is that they read that this not slow, but it's still comparatively slow to the gates. And, and so, yeah, it is part of the whole architecture machinery that also the read that needs to be okay. really fast. Right? So. Yeah, okay, so that's something that here, well, we could try to look into improving it, but yeah, uh... Yeah, what you were saying here, we didn't optimize for it. So it's hard to investigate in this device how short we can go. 
but for sure the readout here was not uh is an early method like we, we had essentially always an hour with it so. can I ask a technical question on the resonator in here um so you went for a um well, it's all about this, uh, you didn't go for a meander uh, resonator, but not for a distributed resonator, but for C and L. Yeah. Can you elaborate the choice? I mean, do you see which one is better? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the directly the, the difference that you see very quickly is that, okay, this is, is that the, their footprint is very it can be quite different, right? So here you just have a capacitor and an inductor and can be a bit smaller than a coplanar waveguide resonator. Uh, but here what you control also quite well is that all of your current is localized in the inductive part and the capacitor, like the voltage fluctuations are on the capacitor, the current fluctuations are on the inductor. So for uh, magnetic field compatibility, uh, this works quite well because you cannot get magnetic vortices in the inductor because it's quite narrow, so they are not going to interact with your currents. So in general, for magnetic field compatible applications, which is what we do in general in our team, we like them because of that. And so the L is invisible, right? The L is, this narrow line is 200 nanometers wide. Is it is meander? It's just or... vertical there in this one, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if... I can see it a bit from here, but it's very hard. It's just a vertical. On the screen, it, it looks better. And uh, you don't have a dot or, or dropping vortices on the capacitor? I think we do. Uh, okay. Yeah, we do have dots everywhere, like some holes. Ah, yeah, you can see them. Oh, yeah, so they're similar to these ones on the ground, but they, we also have them then on the capacitor. But then uh, thank you, everybody.